How many beta users should you have? How do you launch a marketplace app? When should you start charging your users? And how do you even decide on a price point for your app if there aren't existing apps like it? Well, you're gonna have questions just like these as you work toward launching your no-code app. And in this video, we're gonna answer all of those and more. In fact, I've put together a list of some of the common questions our own clients ask us as they go from idea to pilot launch in our Built to Scale program. So we're gonna answer every single one of these because if you don't have these questions now, you will at some point. So make sure you stick around so you get answers to all of them. How many test users should you aim to have for your very first launch? This is one of the most common questions we get because it's hard to figure out when you have enough test users and also when you have too many because there is a sweet spot. Now, the first way to look at this is that it really does depend. So what type of app are you building? If you are building a more generalized, lower price point, consumer focused app that is going to rely on a higher volume of users, then you're naturally going to want a higher volume of test users. If you are building a very specific niche app that is going to probably have a higher price point and a lower user volume, well, you're probably not going to need that higher volume of test users. So first figure out where on that spectrum you fall. But then you need to consider the, the most important factor of all, and that is you want to be looking for trends in the test user feedback you will be getting. So when you have test users go through your app and you have conversations with them or they send in feedback maybe via surveys, however you're gonna be doing it, you don't actually want to act on every single piece of individual feedback you get. If you ask someone for feedback, they're going to give you their opinion. And if you try to act on every single one of those, then you're gonna be running in 10, 20, 50 different directions all at once. It's not sustainable. So instead you want to look for trends in feedback. That way you can prioritize the feedback because it's important to get all the feedback you can but not all feedback is going to be important to implement right away or potentially ever depending on the direction in which you go. Now, the reason why I point this out is because you need enough test users on board your app to pull out trends in feedback. So if you only have three test users, five test users, you're gonna have a hard time finding trends. Once you get up to 10 test users, 20 test users, then you're gonna to start to be able to pick out trends. Now, again, depending on the type of app you're building, that 10, 20 number, that might seem really small and might seem really high. So remember, it depends on the type of app you're building. The biggest thing is to make sure you have enough users to pull out those trends. Now, the second thing you wanna consider is your own capacity. You're going to be doing a lot of manual work when you're going through user testing. You're gonna be having conversations with users. You're going to be intaking that feedback, sifting through it, organizing it, prioritizing it, probably making fixes to your app along the way. And that does take a lot of time. What is your own capacity? Don't bring on so many test users that you can't actually give them the time that they deserve and the time that you need to get the right feedback from them. Now again, this depends on your own situation, but consider one, making sure you have enough to find those trends, and two, making sure you don't have too many to where your capacity becomes too thin to actually go through user testing, giving it the time it deserves. How do you approach the launch of a marketplace app where you have two different user types? How do you run that user outreach? Who do you start with first? Who do you bring on board first? If you try to do it all at once, it can be very overwhelming, but then on the flip side, it kind of seems like a chicken and egg scenario where you can't really figure out who should come first. So one of the easiest ways to approach this is to think about your marketplace app as being a supply side and a demand side. So if we have a job board app example, we have companies as the supply, applicants as the demand. Okay, so 
When you're approaching your user outreach, building a buzz around the app with the demand side. So let's say you have a very simple landing page, for example, where you're collecting email addresses and you put up some posts on social media that drive the demand side toward your landing page to just express their interest in your app. So no action is being taken yet after they opt in other than the fact that they are expressing interest in an app like the one that you were building. Okay, that's kind of like building a buzz around the app because if you haven't built the app yet, it doesn't exist. You are just doing some outreach on social media, although you could do any, any use any type of medium you'd like, but by building that list of interest, you're creating a buzz around the app or rather just proof that there is interest from the demand side. Now you can take that and then when you approach your supply side, the test users who are going to be more critical in the beginning because they are going to be dependent on the app on a more consistent and ongoing basis, if you take that list of interest or that buzz that you've created and you show to them, hey, I have all of these demand side prospective users interested in what you have to offer, I just need you on the app to get you set up as the supply side so that I can kind of open the gates and let them come in and meet you. Well, that's going to give them a lot of incentive to become your early test users. So build the buzz with the demand side, get the email addresses or get the interest on social media, however you wanna do it, and then use that as proof to your supply side as to why they need to come on board as your first test users. Now bring them on board before you bring the demand side on board because then you can get them set up in the app. The supply side is likely going to be the user who's paying for your app. So get them set up, make sure you're meeting their needs, then let those uh, that demand side come on board to meet them. When should you start your initial user outreach and how much of it should you do? This is a confusing question because when you're focusing on development and user outreach, it can be hard to balance the two. First things first, when should you start your initial user outreach? Well, the best answer is literally right now, if you haven't already, there is no reason absolutely no reason to push off your user outreach until a later date. You do not have to have any of your app built yet or any product whatsoever to start doing user outreach. Do it now and just get people's email addresses. That way, once you do have an app, you can actually have a, a pool of prospective users that you can tap into and bring on board immediately. So there is absolutely no reason to hold off on doing that. And the sooner you start, the better off you're going to be. Because remember this, it's your users who will be paying you. So do not put that off. That said, if you are focusing on the development of your app at the same time as doing that user outreach, then your workload can become pretty heavy. So how much user outreach should you actually be doing? Well, the first thing you need to decide is the number of users you want to aim to have on board for that first launch that you go through. So this is gonna depend on the type of app that you're building. If you are building a more generalized app that has a lower price point and is going to be dependent on a higher volume of users to be a worthwhile investment for you, well then you're going to wanna to aim for a higher number of users to bring on board for your very first launch. On the flip side, if you're building a more specific niche app that has a higher price point and is dependent on a lower volume of users, well, you're not going to need quite as many, but you need to figure out an actual goal number for yourself because once you do that, then you can pretty simply just work backwards to figure out how many touch points you need to be doing throughout the development of your app to end up with a prospective user pool that is large enough for your launch. Now, it is really important that you still start your user outreach 
as early as possible. Remember, you don't have to have your app ready in order to do this. You really just need to collect email addresses for now. But the earlier you start, the more information you can gain to help you plan out the number of touch points you need to make in order to hit your user number goal. So let's say it's your goal to launch with 40 users signed up to be your test users. And the way in which you're going to approach these users, your outreach method is going to be email. You're going to be emailing your existing contacts to try to get them to sign up to be those first users for you. Okay, let's just say hypothetically that that is your goal. Well, the earlier you start your outreach, in other words, the earlier you start sending those emails, the sooner you're going to be able to learn how many emails you need to send in order to convert one person into signing up to be one of your early access users. If you need to send five emails in order to convert one person, well, then you need to be making five touch points, right? emails being touch points, but th those can be anything. They can be social media posts, they can be phone calls, whatever is appropriate for you. But if you need to make five for every one person you get to sign up and you want 40 people to sign up, well, then you can just schedule in time to do each of those touch points in order to hit that goal number for your early access users. Okay, so it's all about setting the goal and then starting your user outreach early to get the data you need to schedule in those touch points. What if your user outreach isn't actually working? This can feel very defeating. If you start doing your user outreach, but you are not getting any traction from it, no interest on your social media posts, no responses to your emails, no opt-ins, no registrations, you're gonna to start to ask, what's wrong? What am I doing wrong? Now, the simplest answer to this, and often the correct answer to this, is that you just haven't been doing the outreach consistently and frequently enough. It is going to take time and it is going to take repetition to convert people into becoming your prospective users, your interested users, or your actual users. And so more often than not, if someone's user outreach isn't working, it's because they've only done a few social media posts or they've only sent a few emails or they've only talked to a few people you got to do it more consistently and you got to do it more frequently than that. Now, how consistently, how frequently, this depends on the type of app that you're building. If your prospective users are the first people who you're going to be reaching out to, if they are absolute strangers to you and the way in which you're tapping into your market is also very new for you. So maybe you are reaching out to a market on a social media platform that you don't even really use that much. Uh, so everything is brand new, right? Well, it's gonna take a lot more repetition, a lot more consistency, a lot more outreach to actually convert those people into becoming prospective users on your waiting list or actual users. But on the flip side, on the other end of the spectrum, let's say that the people who you are reaching out to, to be that early pool of test users for your app, let's say that they are existing contacts of yours. Now you still have to do the user outreach, but let's say you are reaching out to them via phone call. You already know them, even if it's just as an acquaintance, but there's already a connection there and you're calling them directly. Well, you're going to have a lot easier time converting them into signing up to be your future user. So it's not going to take as much consistency as much frequency. Now, very likely you're somewhere in the middle, okay? Maybe you have colleagues, connections, um, acquaintances who you're reaching out to via email, okay? So not quite as direct. Well, that is still going to take frequency and consistency. It's going to take following up. The reality is everybody is busy and everybody is always thinking about what they have to do, what's on their plate. 
they are their own priority. It makes sense, right? And so when you reach out to them, even if they know you, even if you have a relationship with them, well, chances are they have other things going on. And so you're going to need to follow up with them. And, and this is just the reality of user outreach, of building a business in general. This is always going to be the case. So if you feel like your user outreach isn't working, you really need to do a gut check. How consistently are you doing it? How frequently are you doing it? And what type of app are you building? What type of market are you trying to enter? What are your connections like? Who are these prospective users? That's gonna help you determine how much you need to do, how consistent, and how frequent you need to be. Should you use paid advertising to get your app's first users? So should you use Facebook ads or Google ads? Well, the approach I always suggest taking is to wait until you have money coming in to start putting money out into paid advertising campaigns, because the reality is there are always going to be lower hanging fruit ways for you to get your first users. And the other thing to keep in mind is that just like you are building the very first version of your app that needs to be tested, that you need to get feedback on, you are going to be sending out when you are trying to acquire users, the very first version of your messaging, of your marketing, and that needs to be tested and you need to get feedback on that. Both things are going to require iterations. Now, can you do that testing while running Facebook ads or Google ads or any, any sort of paid advertising? Yes, of course you can, but you have to understand that you are going to be really just throwing money into research and development in order to test your messaging and your marketing that way. And in the beginning, it's not probably not going to work for you. So because there are always lower hanging fruit ways to get those first users, and with those first users, you can get the feedback you need on your messaging, on your marketing, to then put that into paid advertising campaigns later. That's the better way to approach it when you are in this early stage and especially when you're funding this venture yourself and you need to make sure you're making smart financial decisions. How do you land on the right price point for your app if there aren't existing apps that are the same as yours? In other words, if you don't have competitor apps to look at and to see their price points and sort of use to gauge your own, how do you come up with the right price for your app? Well, there are two ways to, or two things to keep in mind when you're approaching this. The first is this, your app is a solution to a problem. So you need to figure out what it's worth for a person to solve that problem. How much would they pay to solve that problem? Or how much is that problem that they have costing them right now in money, in time, in convenience, in stress, whatever it may be. Now, this is going to require you to have conversations, to do market research, to make sure that you're learning the ins and outs of this, okay? But once you understand what it's worth for someone to solve the problem, your app aside, so don't even think about the actual features of your app. You're just thinking about the problem. How much is it worth it for someone to remove that problem? Okay, when you figure out that, then you're going to be able to land on a, a good starting price point for your app. Now, the second thing to keep in mind is that your pricing is going to change. Okay, no, no matter what, there is a 99.9% a .9 chance that after you price your app and even start bringing users on board at that price point, it is going to change. That's just the way things work. Your app is going to evolve. Your business is going to evolve. Your user base is going to evolve. And so when you keep this in mind, it's going to help you move forward being okay not having the absolute perfect price point figured out. Okay, so figure out how much it's worth for a person to solve a problem, use that as your starting line, and then know that it's going to change. So as you move forward with that starting line, be open to feedback and be open to changing the price point so that you can land on something more suitable from there. All right, if this was helpful, but you want way more help 
going from idea to first launch with your own app, then head to coachingnocodeapps.com forward slash call to apply for a free strategy call. This is the first step our own private entrepreneurs take in applying to work with us in our private coaching program. Now, the focus of that program is on helping them build their first version apps and also build the skill set to go along with that. But we also put a lot of emphasis on enabling them to set themselves up for that first launch start doing their user outreach, make sure they have their test users lined up and more. So if you want help going from idea to pilot launch with your app, then head to coachingnocodeapps.com forward slash call to apply for a free strategy call. All right, I hope this was helpful and we'll see you in the next one.